guys, this is Sebastian, also known as Moonlight Matters. I want to take you uh, around my studio for a tour. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you can hear some stuff you've never heard before and uh, pick up some new stuff that inspires you in some sort of way. Yo. So first we're going to try uh, some of the synths that are um, most of my favorite synths. Um, those are the ones that are uh, practically the closest as well. Uh, when I want to use a different machine, I just use, I just take it and put it closer. So, uh, but some of my favorite stuff is most close. Um, for example, the um, Omega 8 by Studio Electronics is a really amazing synth. Um, you can see it here, it's the big purple beast. Um, it's a synth that's really versatile. Um, it's probably the most versatile um, analog sub subtractive synth I have next to the Alesis Andromeda. Um, it's a fairly uh, simple architecture you would expect from other uh, analog subtractive stuff. Um, but there are some special things in there which allow you to uh, modify the character of the overall sound a bit. I'm gonna go through some patches and then you can hear some stuff. Some stuff is really lush, some stuff is really powerful. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, things in there. I'm gonna play it from the D50 here because that's the one I use as a master keyboard. It's a really lush sound. Um, this patch was made with two oscillators that both have all the uh, waveforms activated and there is a really slow uh, LFO, a different LFO on each uh, VCO just to mimic the fact that old analog material can drift a bit. Um, this is already analog but uh, with the, the LFOs you can make it sound even more analog. So that's what you hear. There's a little bit of uh, movement in the sound because of it. So I'm just going to go through some presets here. Eighties kind of bass, really nice sounding. Um, it's in unison right now, which of course gives it the eight voices two oscillators per voice, all the waveforms activated, so you can imagine it's a pretty powerful sounding little synth. Brassy kind of stuff. More kind of like an Italo bass. fat resonance. So the cool thing about this synth as well is that you have different kind of filters in there. Uh, you can uh, put boards in there with different kinds of filters. Um, mine has um, the standard uh, 24 dB uh, MOOC uh, low pass filter but it also has the Oberheim um, filters, the 12 dB, uh, the band pass, the high pass, the low pass. Um, so everything is in there. Um, I also have the TB303 filters in there, which is nice if you want to make a TB kind of asset kind of vibe. And also the ARP2600 filters, which are really interesting and sound really powerful. Um, you also have the possibility to add CS80 filters in there, which probably one day will join my synth as well, but they're not in there for now. Uh, so let me just go through a few more presets, just to give you an idea. As you can hear, it's already less of an obvious subtractive analog sound, so um, there, as I said, there is some special stuff in here that, uh, that makes it not only have different modulation possibilities than other synths, but also sound a little different. For example, you can completely screw this sound up just by, just by uh, turning one knob. Just 
back to normal <laughs> and have like a normal, more normal, normal kind of sounding uh, sound. More kind of like funky bass relying on the resonance of the filter. powerful, really useful in any situation. Uh, if you think about buying your first analog synth second hand, this is a really, really good choice and uh, you're probably never going to need another synth, although you can start collecting more like I do and become half of a synth freak. <laughs> so let's move on. Um, we're now moving on to the Andromeda. Um, as I said, it's probably the most versatile analog synth I have in my studio. Uh, the reason for that is because it just has a lot of uh, modulation possibilities that other analog subtractive synths don't have. Um, for example, if I'm correct, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, almost every parameter can modulate the other parameters. So um, just to give you an example, you can build a drone sound on this synth that is going to go on for 24 hours and you'll probably never hear the same thing twice. Um, so that's really cool about it. Next to that, it has 16 analog voices, two uh, VCOs per voice, uh, with two, um, two oscillators per voice, sorry, with two sub oscillators. And then you have a range of different filters you can use. You can use them parallel, you can use them um, after each other. Um, so there's a lot of stuff to do with this. You can get uh, some quite unique tones from this because of the modulation capabilities. But next to that, it also has an engine optimizer, which allows you to um, change the whole character of the synth. You can change the fastness of the envelopes, of the filters, of the pitch. So um, once you've played around with some old analog synths and you know what are the trademark uh, things about them, it's actually kind of most of the time possible to mimic the sound on the Andromeda. Um, a comment I hear quite often is that people say it's, a, it's an analog trance synth, but that's probably because the synth gets sold with, uh, with a bank full of trance presets. So, if you buy it, take some more time to really dig into it and do more with it than just uh, skipping the presets, because it's uh, it's a really amazing uh, it's a really amazing synth. Um, you have an output per voice. You have an analog distortion on board. Um, you have an uh, effects engine on board that isn't really that usable in a recording kind of situation. But if you're looking for inspiration and just trying to add an effect real quickly. It's really, uh, it's really nice to do. Um, so I'm gonna go through some pre random presets here. I'm gonna warn you, there's a lot of different stuff in here, like uh, really smooth stuff, but also really harsh stuff. So uh, it's not what you would expect, but then again, it's, it's how you program the synth, you know. Uh, you can't blame a synth for sounding uh, a, a certain way, or especially in a style way, because you have to uh, program the presets yourself and, and make it sound like you want. Uh, I think there are two very important things to distinguish about a synth and that's how the sonic character is and then how the sounds are programmed on it because that are two things I find people quite often mixed up so it's for me personally uh, an important thing to uh, keep separated. So um, one of my favorite synth uh, sounds on here is, is a patch I've called Sexy Bass. Um, I've used it on uh, different productions, one of them being uh, the Shindu Happy House track I did for Kitsune. That's a cover of Suxi and the Banshees, that's the bass we used for it. So it's pretty straightforward, but the color is nice and uh, it's really, really powerful. It really cuts in a mix uh, 
most of the time you you have to take down a little low end like for example the same with the memory MOOC to make it fit in the mix but that's a good thing you know rather take something out that that is there than try to add something that's not there or try to bring out something that's not there so the bass sounds like this <laughs> You can make like funky stuff with it, but also just play it long notes is really cool. So I'm gonna skip through a few more presets here. That I don't know what's gonna come up, but I'm just gonna press some keys. You can hear it's pretty modern. Uh, you have three LFOs, so there's a lot of stuff you can do. Just like kind of like a hip hop kind of sub bass with an envelope on the pitch. More like a popcorn kind of sound. Wish I could play the riff, but sorry. <laughs> Fat sub basses, uh, really good kind of TB kind of sound. Not bad for something that's not a real TB or trying to be. More high melodic stuff. It's more like short kind of chord. Crazy stuff. Organ kind of stuff. Sounding pretty huge for an organ. Really mellow stuff. This is what you actually hear is the resonance self oscillating of one of the filters. So there is no VCO being used for this sound. Um, Although you can make it perfectly with just some VCOs and the right uh, waveforms. Really cool sync sounds. It even almost sounds like massive, you know, like the talkative kind of synths, but this is all analog subtractive stuff, so it's, it's really versatile. distortion going on there. This is like uh, more like a trance kind of. So you know it's all in the since I have a passion here somewhere I don't know exactly where it is but where I try to replicate a lead I made on my CS60 and it, it's really amazing no, that's not it's one of the variations of it but I guess you can get the picture. It's uh, it's actually a really amazing synth for me. Um, it's one of the first analog ones I bought, so 
because of the fact that it has so many modulation capabilities, it took me some time to get really into the synth. But then again, when you get into it, you can get really a lot out of it. Plus, uh, once you know how to work with an Andromeda, uh, I think you can pretty much tackle any synth from there on. So that's a good start. <laughs> Let's go to the Prophet VS. Um, sequential circuits, Dave Smith, uh, synth guru uh, for sure. Um, this synth I use more for digital kind of stuff, obviously, because they are not analog uh, oscillators, but they're waveforms. The interesting thing is you can interpolate between them. You can uh, set up an LFO, so uh, it interpolates between the four waveforms, so that way it can get you kind of special kind of textures, and also because of the digital character, it's gonna behave uh, totally different in, in a mix. So uh, apart from what sounds you program on it, I sometimes choose it if I need a sound that cuts through the mix in a different way than analog stuff does. Um, I can play some presets here. I'm gonna have to play it from the D50 uh, again because the keyboard doesn't work anymore and apparently the chips I need for it uh, are no longer available or haven't been duplicated or replicated yet, so. We got a small arpeggiator set up here. Really gives you a good idea of the bell kind of type sounds you can do with it. Uh, but there's loads more in there. There are basses in there. Uh, let me just mute the arpeggiator here for a moment. It's really special, uh, but you can also just program normal, normal sounds on there. Not every sound has to be uh, a sound interpolating with the with, with all the waveforms. Uh, it's a good example of uh, the texture kind of feel you get from uh, from the Prophet VS. Um, Something high pass filtered, obviously. This is probably a typical uh, VS sound, a uh, really bell belly kind of sound that probably will work well with the, with the arpeggiator again. If I activate it. Makes me think of... Um, 80s series and uh, and stuff like that. In a way, it kind of sounds like old school samplers, uh, probably because of the analog digital converters. I don't know the exact one in here, but uh, there are some aliasing going on, which you can also find in uh, older samplers. And so that's another char characteristic uh, why it's good to use. It's different. And there, let me go through a few more presets. See, it's like the beginning of uh, an 80s news bulletin or something. <laughs> let me go through a few more. I think I've gone over the most important thing. So digital oscillators, all the rest is analog. The envelopes are analog, which makes it snappy. Uh, the filter is analog, which gives a really nice tone to it. Um, the resonance is, is really nice. Um, so overall, it's a very good uh, synth. But for people that don't like the analog tone of synths, I wouldn't recommend it as a first synth. It's, uh, it's something very special. It's a different color. Uh, but very interesting synths. So next synth we're going to is the banana synth. Uh, as you can see from its appearance, it's a lot similar to the early Oberheim synths. Uh, 
Um, I should go on the net and check the whole history again, but if I'm correct, um, the guy who made the banana was working on Synths with Tom as well. And at a certain point, they decided to go to both go each ways. Uh, again, I'm not sure if that's the real story, but he made the banana synth, and uh, Tom went on to uh, make the Oberheim OBXA, which I have over there as well. Um, I guess the biggest difference between the two is um, that this synth is made with SSM chips instead of SEM chips, and I must say there is a different tone to it. Um, it's something you have to hear or at least play with for a few days before you notice what's the, what the difference is between the SSM and the SEM uh, kind of sound. So for me that's, it's a pretty interesting sin because most of the analog polyphonic stuff I have in here are based on SEM chips. Uh, so it's really interesting to have uh, an SSM chip uh, based synth uh, here as well. Um, there is a story about this synth. Um, if I can believe the previous owner, it used to be a synth from Car Carlos Peron. Uh, you know, the famous uh, synth guru. Um, he signed it uh, in 1978 and now it's here in, in my studio and I'm happy to be, to be playing on it. Uh, I'm going to go through f a few presets as well. Um, just to explain a bit, I've hooked up the banana synth to the mixer of the System 100. Um, that is over here. The reason for that being is because I can use the spring reverb that's in the System 100 mixer just to add uh, a little depth to the, to the whole thing actually. Um, so let me just go through some presets. dark bass more kind of like um, a pianet a clavinet kind of sound um, like you would use on funk or disco or uh, snappy kind of chord stuff. Um, this one does the sync sounds very good as well. Uh, sync sounds, I find nice to use them on a vocal or lead line or something uh, because they tend to um, uh, they tend to emphasize the vocal character a bit of, uh, of a synth. Uh, kind of a stab synth. Might have some overdrive on the mixer, but that's okay. kind of stuff, really, really powerful filter. Detuned oscillators. Powerful leads. There is a really fat kind of bass in here somewhere. I put in there. 
This is a really, really nasty preset. <laughs> no processing going on here the overdrive here is just uh, because I've put the oscillators really loud and the uh, spring reverb adds to it a little as well more pads In this one you can hear the resonance of the synth really well Kind of, kind of pads. Every time I play the synth, I hear a bunch of 80s records. While it's probably really rare and hasn't been used on them, but it's such an inspiration. The synth, every sound you play, every note you play is just the beginning of a new song, and that's the kind of synths that I like. Everything is there. It's like a clavicimbal, kind of like a Mozart piano. Not that hard to program on any synth actually, but nice to have it in here as well. Here we are with the bass again. So what you hear now is one voice, I can also put it into unison where you really get the, the power out of the synth. different kind of textures. You can imagine uh, when you start working with uh, a, tape, a tape echo on that, you can get some really nice stuff. So, as you can see, almost everything uh, is in there. And it's actually a really, it's a fairly simple architecture, but in some way, uh, this synth has been calibrated or has ever since been decalibrated that it sounds special. And it seems like the range of some parameters are really different uh, from other old analog stuff, which gives it just uh, that, that extra edge. Uh, add the SSM filters to that and you have a really special synth that is really useful in any kind of production. Okay, so the next synth we have over here is the Prophet 5. Uh, one of the most legendary synths by far. Uh, after Bob Moog making uh, the Mini Moog, the one voice amazing uh, analog synth. Uh, again, Dave Smith from Sequential Circuits at the time. Uh, he came up with a really nice uh, and the, the first actually analog polyphonic synths, meaning you can play more than one key. Um, the architecture is pretty basic. Uh, mine is the Rev3 uh, that doesn't have the MIDI, so I play most of it live or trigger it uh, through CV gate. Um, it's a fairly straightforward architecture. Um, but in, on the contrary to what some people claim, it being not a really fast synth, I think mine is pretty fast and pretty powerful. Like if you use the unison mode for basses, 
it's really powerful. Um, every old synth has a little different uh, sound, I mean from the same type. Uh, that's because over the years the calibration has gone different. Um, for me that's something positive. Some people want to have all their synths calibrated. For me I love them uh, more uncalibrated because there tends to be more life in there and uh, you can get some more vivid and interesting textures uh, out of it. Um, so really good bread and butter synth. Um, I think if you want to learn about synths, this is a really good synth. And I'm not just talking about the hardware version, but you have some software versions out there. Um, it's a really good synth to be become familiar with the basic uh, analog subtractive uh, structure of a synth. Um, next we're going to move to the Memory Moog, which is probably one of my favorite synths. Uh, I know a lot of people that have one, uh, have one that doesn't stay stable for a long while. Uh, mine is fairly okay, it's a plus version uh, which has the MIDI on board. Um, I have one voice that tends to drift out of tune once it's been on for like uh, 45 minutes to an hour. Um, so the thing is when I work with this synth, uh, I, I tend to work fast with it. Um, but then again I know it that well that for me it's quite easy to uh, replicate stuff I've done before uh, even by ear, not even by selecting uh, presets on it. Um, so um, the interesting bit about this synth is you have three oscillators per voice instead of two. Um, that's really interesting because it's probably the only analog polyphonic synth uh, out there that has three oscillators per voice. Uh, you can stack all the waveforms on top of each other. So I guess you can imagine uh, having the, the synth in unison mode with uh, all the waveforms on. Um, you have an 18, an, an 18 um, oscillator bass going on or something which really can just shake the walls and, uh, and do crazy stuff. Um, Again, it's really versatile. Of course, uh, how you program the synth matters a lot. Um, but this is the, the type of synth again that every sound is probably going to inspire you to make a track. So, the memory Moog. Let's go through some patches, uh, random patches. <laughs> Here it's a really powerful synth. This is just one voice, you know. The grain of it is really special. Um, the keyboard envelop, um, the keyboard tracking is really nice. You have different modes uh, where you, you can have stuff open at the bottom, closed, uh, closed on top, and the other way around. Uh, the filter is amazing. Uh, the self oscillation of the filter is amazing. Uh, it's the classical Moog 24 dB uh, filter uh, because the oscillators aren't discrete components like the memory, like the mini Moog. There are SEM chips as well, um, but because of the mixer and the VCAs and the overdrive of that, it kind of sounds uh, sounds uh, similar to my ear though. <laughs> like an alien thunder going on here. Uh, let me go through some more. This is a patch where you can hear the self oscillator of the filter very well. It can really be used as an extra oscillator uh, if you're um, a little bit handy in programming stuff and matching up uh, pitches and stuff like that. This is a really nasty bass. Really amazing sounding. Uh, this is a unison patch as well. I'll just uh, make a small sequence here real fast. 
so I can turn some knobs while the sound is playing. For example, to show you how fast the LFO can go, it's really amazing. It goes into sonic, uh, sonic depth, so let me just uh, do that for you. Really nice for effect sounds. Um, really nice for a sweep, sweep kind of stuff, as you can hear, uh, climax kind of stuff. Um, I love the way the oscillator goes into audible range. Next um, is definitely one of my favorite uh, synths of all times. Um, the reason being because um, I've got a lot of analog stuff, but uh, these oscillators are the fattest I've ever come across. Um, you can play a note uh, on this uh, with just two oscillators going on and I haven't found anything to match it. Um, it's pretty basic in the sense that the modulation possibilities aren't that uh, aren't that extended. Um, like one of the drawbacks of this synth is you only have one envelope, so it takes a little uh, creative programming to to get some really cool sounds out of it. Um, I also have all the original patch books for this one and the original uh, promotion uh, folders and everything, so I got the whole deal. I have the speakers here as well, uh, which aren't really useful unless you want to go sit on an island with this machine and uh, make some music. Um, I've, I've mic'd them as well, just to add on top of the line out that, uh, that I recorded, uh, which can give a nice uh, result. It's almost like uh, tracking a guitar uh, straight through the eye and doing, the same, doing it at the same time through an, an amp or something. So you can probably compare with that. But it's not really uh, it's not really um, a technical thing that that you you want to use. It's just nice to have the whole thing. Um, you also have the sequencer here, um, which is fairly easy to use. The only drawback for me is that uh, the steps are non um, non they are not calibrated, so you really have to look for the notes yourself instead of just clicking through through to the next node. Uh, but then again, you, you don't have to use it just for uh, pitch or, or gate. You can use it for filter stuff. You can use it for all kinds of uh, stuff you want to you wanna bring motion to. Um, so that's nice. Um, the mixer you have here is pretty nice because I like the, the preamps that are in there. Um, these are all discrete components, uh, so they sound really good. It's um, it's a different different world. It's a different sound, and obviously the spring reverb that's in here uh, is the same one or practically the same one uh, from the Roland Space Echoes, which is really famous. Uh, I've used it on a lot of um, recordings, and um, it's like a universe of its own. It, it was meant to be a music station where you can just take take the whole machine and, and make half a track on it, like Vangelis uh, did a lot. Uh, if I'm correct, um, he made the sequence of the Pulsar, uh, at least with the sequence, I'm not sure if he used uh, the two synth modules or the CS60 for that one. There's definitely some pulse with modulation and stuff going on, which you can perfectly uh, do on this synth. Um, so the funny thing with all the booklets I have is, you can program sounds on there called duck or goose or something and have a really quirky sound coming out of it. Out of it. Um, but then again, you can have like the really modern and basic kind of stuff coming out there. Um, from time to time, I tend to use my synths more as an uh, orchestral uh, kind of thing. So 
and from the booklets knowing what waveform you have to use if you want to mimic a clarinet or whatever is, is always nice to know. Um, it also has a, a big uh, Wendy or Walter Carlos uh, feel to it for me. Um, I can imagine uh, Wendy or, or Walter um, sitting at home behind the, the big uh, MOOC system and recording everything track by track. This is the same kind of machine, uh, not with the same kind of uh, modulation possibilities, but it has the same kind of feel. Uh, once you're behind it, you feel in a 70s kind of sci-fi space movie, and that's always a great thing with the synth for me. Uh, I've set up one patch here because obviously there are no patch memories so if we want to go for a completely different sound we have to reprogram the whole thing but I've, uh, I've set something up here and um, taking it in on, this, on the System 100 mixer and then again using my Space Echo, uh, my uh, Super Echo on it, it's an Evans ES5 it's uh, different uh, from the Roland's. Uh, I haven't been able to find a lot of information about it on the net, but to me it sounds nice. It has a really old tape in there that crackles, which I really love. And there is even like um, some kind of damage on the tape, which makes it sound even, even older, you know. Other people, again, they would change it as quick as possibly. For me, that adds to the whole character of the thing, like having a, an analog synth that's not calibrated. So the sound I've set up here is like basically a big uh, lead kind of sound. Uh, let me play it. You have obviously no velocity on this, so as you can hear on this sound, um, one of the tricks you can pull um, to get more dynamic in the sound is like uh, program the envelops, envelops in a way that if you play it short, it doesn't open a lot, so you have more like a closed sound than when you play the note longer, it opens up, uh, like this for example. think there is some velocity going on there but that's just the length of the note and the, the envelope of the filter just programmed right. Um, maybe I should turn off the space echo for a moment and just go through the waveforms because they are really amazing. Um, I'll go for the bottom one, the 101, the model 101 and just go through the basic waveforms. Take down the noise a bit. Uh, give me a sec. Take this one out here. So you can hear it's really fat and nasty. Just a little bit less, but you need a softer waveform as well. You can put an LFO on the on the pulse width. So we have some pulse width modulation to make the sound moving. It's really nice for uh, for evolutive bass or for uh, for lead sounds. Um, if you want to get them moving a little little bit more, um, so let me put the VCU sync back in. Um, then. Um, there are two oscillators on here, but the different thing is they're actually two synths. So you would think it's a two oscillator synth. You can use it as a two oscillator synth, but it's actually two different synths, uh, which gives you the capability of layering sounds and using it in some kind of primitive multi-timbral form, uh, which is nice for lead sounds. Um, you can imagine if you play a lead uh, and you stack it with something else, a different sound, a whole different texture, a whole different uh, world can open so that's really nice to do uh, with with the system 100 and as you can see I use it a lot just to patch things through because of the sound 
and because of the spring reverb and because of the tape delay that is really easy to use uh, on, on this whole system. Okay, next up is one of my beasts, obviously, uh, it takes, uh, takes up a lot of room in the studio, but it's, I think it's definitely worth it, uh, especially if you're a fan of the, the old Yamaha uh, organs that introduced the divide down technology. Um, these are the ancestors of the CS60, CS80, uh, CS50, CX70 as well, CS40M as well. Um, so they all have uh, a similar texture um, to them. Um, this organ is not just an organ, it also has some synthy stuff on board, some cool uh, rhythm stuff, an arpeggiator, bass pedals you can use. Um, and I have both speakers as well, which um, which is, uh, is is not easy to to get. Um, but obviously I don't use these to mic them or, or something like that. So I record everything through the headphone outputs with, that is over here uh, on the bottom of the, uh, of the organ. And uh, let me first start by the top section, which is basically uh, the, uh, the, um, the ancestor of the Yamaha SY1 that is uh, over here. Uh, with a few small differences, but you can hear they're very similar to each other and they come from the same family. So, for example, um, when I start with the top section here, the small keyboard, um, it's more like a lead synth kind of thing, so monophonic. And you have some presets here um, in the solo keyboard section um, that you can adjust uh, to liking. Um, I'm just going to go through some of the presets that are on here and uh, play some stuff, uh, some small stuff on here. You can even go into the bass regions. This will sound familiar to a few people. <laughs> Over to the saxophone preset. Right. <laughs> Sounds good though. More of a harpsichord kind of thing. This one they call electrical guitar. And then you have uh, four funny presets. So. <laughs> they sound pretty funny. Another funny one. Really loving the resonance on this. More kind of like a square thing they call clarinets, trumpets. Let's go to the flugel horn. If you program it right, it has a really vocal kind of quality to this. So it's uh, with the portamento setup, um, you can almost make like um, thurman, thurman kind of sounds with it. So uh, it's, that's something nice. Uh, you can probably get it out of any synth if you know how to program, but here it's in there and it's, it sounds retro and right to me personally right away. The violin. <laughs> Jazz guitar, double read, and then another funny one, more funny ones. So that's the top section, um, you can adjust a lot of stuff like portamento, attack sustain, um, you can uh, adjust the pitch and the wah, which is like a filter effect for the attack. 
Uh, you even have a sample and hold function. And then over here, um, you have the whole uh, modulation uh, section for playing it. Like, for example, uh, what they tried to introduce was some sort of uh, aftertouch, a uh, really useful tool in a lot of musical music production, especially when you're playing with both hands and you want to give some dynamic to, to the music. It's a really nice uh, feature to use. But instead of uh, making the function activate when you press the key down and press through harder, um, the system back then was you had to shake the keyboard left and right to make the modulation. So I'm uh, going to give a small example here. That's a normal tone. So if I press through, nothing happens. Once I start wiggling the keyboard, you can hear the modulation going on. So a really expressive tool um, to, to make a good lead sound just with one take or just with one sound actually. Um, then when we get to the middle section, um, this is more like uh, the normal uh, organ uh, that's in there, uh, where you have all the registers you can open here. Uh, right now I've got just about um, most of the registers open. Sounds like a normal organ. Um, you also have the vibrato, the touch sensitivity in here, um, as you can hear. Then when you take down all the registers here, you also have like two preset kind of sounds, chimes and vibraphone, which is pretty cool to use, I think can work on more like uh, even deep house or, uh, or new disco kind of more, more deep kind of vibe. So, you know, basically, uh, basically your normal average organ, but then, uh, you know, in a, in a really, really nice uh, outfit. Um, once we get to the lower keyboard, um, we have the D85 talking to us right now. Let me switch it off for a moment. Um, so once we get to the lower keyboard, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. Um, obviously, you can um, link everything together. For example, you can play the, the monosynth on the lower keyboard and all that stuff, or you can put everything together. Um, right now, let me see. I've got a sort of sequence set up. Sounds really nice. For some reason, I always have to think of the band Air while I'm playing this, so that's that's the the time era that uh, rings a bell for me. There is also a rhythm box in here, which is pretty decent, and an internal uh, spring reverb, Yamaha spring reverb. Uh, sadly, you can only use it for things of, uh, in the organ. There is no uh, input for it, but it sounds really nice. And uh, let me see if I can get the rhythm section working. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> so everything is uh, synced up to each other. So as you can imagine, it's not the most modern way of making music, but this is an instrument that um, at the time when it was invented, it gave you the possibility to make a whole uh, song on, on one keyboard. Um, it doesn't sound useful in that way these days, but then again the principle stays the same in the sense that you can come up here and have just a few good chords and, and then just get, um, get playing and discover uh, everything that has to go on in the rest of the song and then you translate it to other gear or to other stuff. But this is like, uh, it's a piece of inspiration uh, and obviously the sounds, you know, it's, 
it all sounds right. Like um, I'm not saying you can't program analog or old sounding stuff with massive and a few good plugins. Uh, on the contrary, I think you can you can really do it. It's going to sound a little different, but you're going to get there, and the character will be the same or more or less the same. Uh, on this kind of keyboard, you just press a key and it's there. And for me, since uh, I love the retro sounding stuff, uh, that's a real asset uh, to to the whole thing. Actually, um, I can go through some of the presets here for the lower. <laughs> You have all these supposed uh, flutes, trombones, cellos, pianos and stuff, but as you can hear once you use it in the whole context, it, sound, it just sounds like a cool uh, vintage synth. You can adjust the brightness, you can transpose uh, the two sort of oscillators that are in there. Which doesn't work when you're arpeggiating, of course. Um, and then there is a whole bunch of possibilities, as I said, to link a lot of stuff together, which really gives you the possibility of, uh, yeah, just doing a lot with one keyboard or even one chord. And as I said, if you're looking for an inspiration, that's a really good thing. Um, so from here on, I think the logical thing is to move on to one of the younger brothers of uh, this one and that's the Yamaha D85 we're going to now. Okay, the next one is, uh, as we said, is a D85 by Yamaha. It's a younger brother of the EX1 that, that is over here. As you can hear, it doesn't have a great day today. It's making a little bit of noise. Uh, it has its moments. Uh, I once had it, uh, it, it caught fire, and uh, but it still works, so once in a while you'll probably hear a sound that's going to make some noise. Um, so if I want to record it, I just have to wait for a good day for it. <laughs> but again, uh, this is the kind of organ um, where you can do a lot with just pressing a few keys. For example, I'm just going to press a chord here. You can hear the drums going already. I'm going to bring in the bass now. There we have some bass. Um, you can vary the bass, you can program patterns in there, everything. Um, next we're going to bring in is what they call the rhythmic chords. <laughs> oh, I thought I heard my grandmother. No. <laughs> so, uh, another thing we can bring in is the bring in is the auto arpeggios. There we go with our song. We already have half a song already. Then we can adjust the sustain of the arpeggiators. So that's a cool, another cool thing to get some inspiration uh, from. Midsection is also a string section and chord uh, um, organ section comparable to uh, the big beast here behind me. Um, the top synth as well, you have a, just a little bit less modulation possibilities, but it's really nice. Uh, I picked this up for 150 euros uh, somewhere from a guy who had it in his painting uh, shop and uh, he just used it uh, to have some recreational uh, minutes of making music next to the painting. And uh, so if you can pick it up for 150 euros, it's really worth it, uh, even just for the top synths. Uh, as I said, it's also comparable to the SY1 uh, from Yamaha, one of my favorite mono synths that was uh, over there. And um, you immediately hear it has the same kind of vibe to it.
used on a lot of funk records and um, soundtracks at the time. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm having a little trouble here with the output. But I guess you get the picture. Not bad for 150 euros, right? Moving on. Here uh, I have the Roland G JD800. It's um, a, a kind of rumpler synth in the sense that uh, it doesn't use like really VCOs or, or, or uh, DCOs or whatever. Um, it uses uh, waveforms, um, but it's really nice because there are some really cool strings in there, textures. Um, there is also a really heavy bass in there. And once you start scrolling through the presets, you can hear a lot of hit, hit 90s hit records in there. So there's always a sound in there you can use. But for me, it's not a synth that I have hooked up all the time. It's uh, whenever I want to have something different, I just put it up there. The good thing uh, about this synth as well is uh, it has a really good interface. There is a, a slider for everything, so that's a nice thing. Uh, you can layer a lot of stuff, uh, you can make some cool orchestral stuff with this. Uh, also one of the synths that got used a lot by Evangelist in a later stage. So uh, pretty interesting if you can pick it up for cheap. Um, next up here we have uh, Simmons SDS-1. Um, that's the first, uh, if I'm correct, the first uh, drum pad made by Simmons. And um, the cool thing is uh, when you want a, d a different sound, you need a different EEPROM and an EEPROM is just a chip like this um, that you have to put in there just to get another sound. So um, you can take it out here like this and put in another chip and then you have another sound with small modulation possibilities. Uh, but obviously at the time this was really uh, an amazing thing because most of the drums uh, were coming from drum machines or from uh, real drums, uh, Simmons came up with a way to introduce uh, electronic drums to real drummers. Um, I also have the big drum that's in the back of the studio and a whole lot of uh, modules and expanders and MIDI, uh, MIDI modules and trigger modules for it. Um, so it's not something I would use on every production. Uh, most of the sounds I've already sampled them from uh, from there, so uh, once you get that, uh, the only fun that's left left actually is really hitting the thing, you know, which can be nice, of course. Um, next up here is the UBXA. Um, I bought this synth for a fairly small amount of money. It was a, fr a four voice originally, and uh, for some reason, uh, I found uh, four new voices the next week on eBay. So now I have an eight voice. It's probably a really rare thing to happen. Uh, so now it's an 8 voice, uh, it needs to be recalibrated, uh, that's why it's here. I still use it for monophonic uh, unison uh, kind of sounds though. Um, it's, it's an amazing synth, I mean, if you're a Prince lover, you're gonna love this synth for sure. Uh, he played a lot of stuff on there. Um, a lot of people say the Van Halen uh, riff was played on there, but I think there is doubt between the OBX and OBXA. Anyway, they sound really great on both. And um, it's a really great synth to have. Um, the filters are obviously different. Different. It's not the 12 dB low pass filter, uh, 24 dB low pass filter. It's a 12 dB low pass filter, which gives it just a different character. And uh, it's also SEM based. Um, mine is the version that can only store 40 somewhat presets. Um, but there are upgrades out there right now. You can convert them to 120 uh, storage and, and put new MIDI in there and uh, stuff like that. So as I said, it has to be calibrated, but I use it from time to time to play stuff live uh, for like unison basses because if you use the voices separately and they're not calibrated, uh, the volume is different. And so that's why I only uh, use it for that right now. So um, next is the Roland. Juno 106. It's actually a synth um, that my neighbor left here. He moved two days ago. Steph, you have to come pick up your synth. Um, it's a really, it's a really great synth. I mean, it's a basic synth. It's not VCOs. It's DCOs. 
but it can sound really fat and it's only one oscillator and the sub oscillator but if you know how to program it a little it's really nice i would say if you want to get into hardware uh, vintage synth this is really a good start it's bread it's a bread and butter synth uh, it's a budget synth uh, it's a synth that's stable to use live so a lot of good things to say about the Juno um, if you google a bit about it you're gonna find numerous uh, hit records or whatever records made with it um, next up is something of the same caliber uh, I mean a very nice bread and butter synth, obviously totally different uh, style of uh, synthesis, this is FM synthesis, the DX7, it's the 2D I have. Um, this is a synth that's actually not easy to program, um, because you only have one uh, data slider or two data, data sliders to go through the whole parameters. So what I personally did with this synth when I bought it, um, I got an editor of the net and then I just started downloading patches. It's not my normal way of doing things, but for this synth I thought it was the best way to do it. So what I did was I went to, through 20,000 something patches in a week time and I stored all the banks uh, in the editor. So uh, whenever I need it now I just take it out and uh, take my presets that I stored in the editor and just load them in there. Um, this is the 2D, as I said before. Um, the biggest differences are that this has a 14-bit analog digital converter, while the normal DX7 has the 12 or 8, can, can say that for sure. And for me, the biggest reason to buy this one is the fact you can use it in unison, uh, which can bring up some pretty, pretty cool bases. Uh, DX, DX bases... Uh, can be cool uh, for a lot of uh, styles of music. Um, obviously, if you're gonna do what I did, be prepared to spend some days in the studio and uh, make sure you're comfy. <laughs> um, next, this is the uh, Yamaha YC45D. Um, it's actually an organ, a really basic organ. Again, um, this it's one of the presiders, sorry, it's one of the presiders of uh, the D85, so a lot less functions in there. Um, but as you can see, you have the strip, the same strip you can find on a CS60 or a CS80, um, which, which was already enough appeal for me to buy it. Um, next to that, it's not that interesting. I mean, it's more a piece of... Uh, it's more a piece of, uh, of uh, decoration, actually, if I can say it like that. Um, but this is the first organ I bought uh, when I didn't have any money to buy serious synths that got me the closest to owning a CS60 or CS80. <laughs> so uh, if, you, if you don't have the money for one, uh, you can buy this one. I'm telling you, it's just to look at though, because for the rest, there are a few good sounds in there. It's funny to play around with the ribbon, uh, but for the rest, it's pretty basic. Um, there's a few bits and bobs I haven't talked about yet. I'm gonna go through them fast. Uh, for example, this is the Roland T TR606. Uh, it's a really legendary uh, machine. I think if you don't have the money to buy a real 808, this is definitely worth it. There are some uh, kits out there to uh, customize them that are really nice. I've heard really, really good stuff coming out of these. Um, another cool thing of which I have uh, all three of them is the Boss Dr. Pads. Uh, it's not a revolutionary uh, machine, but it's nice to take on live uh, and you can you can hit it and modulate some stuff. So it's it's really nice just to do some stuff live. Um, I also have an Oberheim expander back here, uh, which I can hear you think, why is it that far? It's pretty far because for me, it's something I would only use on a few, uh, few records. Um, the reason for that being is that the envelopes are pretty slow and modulation possibilities are pretty close to the Andromeda, which is a better alternative for me. Um, the SH-101 is definitely a, a typical bass synth that, that is all, always works. You can always get a useful sound out of it. Also a very good sound to get into uh, analog su subtractive synthesis and start programming. Um, next to this, we have the Lindrum, uh, which I've obviously sampled empty. Um, so I have all the samples in my computer. Um, I also found a drum machine with almost the same kind of swing function as the Lindrum where I can load all the samples in. So that's, uh, it's, it's a really uh, handy thing to do and it doesn't take uh, as much time as, uh, 
as hooking up the, the whole machine. It happens uh, from time to time that I hook it up and, and start program, programming some drums on there. Uh, but most of the time I use the samples. Um, right here I have another small Casio. You have to have a Casio. Uh, the CZ101. Uh, it's a really small and cheap synth, but it was used on a lot of revolutionary techno songs and early house songs. Uh, very straightforward um, interface and modulation possibilities. So again, a good starter synth and also great to use live. Uh, I know some people that uh, make amazing stuff uh, with, with it. Um, what I have here is the Simmons SDS-9, the electronic drums. Um, I use it to hook it up to my uh, my Simmons drum um, whenever whenever I feel like it. Um, it's it's a little bit more interesting sound wise than Lindrum for me because you have some more parameters to uh, adjust the the sounds with. Um, if I'm correct, the bass and the snare and or the bass and the toms are analog. And all the rest is EEPROM, I think, is just another chip you have to uh, put in here. Let me open this real quick for you and see. Yeah, as you can see, uh, the snare the, and the rims are uh, EEPROM, so are actually samples, and the rest is uh, more like an 808 style kind of sound generator, which doesn't really sound like the 808, but the principle is... Uh, I can imagine is, is pretty much the same. Um, here I've got two pads, no idea what brand they're from. I bought them second hand. Um, they've put a Dynacord sticker on it, but <laughs> I don't think they're Dynacord. Um, so yeah, it's nice to, to use live. Uh, I mean, if you have some percussion stuff with you, uh, it changes the whole dynamic of a live situation. Um, so yeah, that's about it for this corner apart from the Roland GX8P with the PG800 programmer I have here. I um, have to say if you're into disco, Italo uh, and even old school electro sounds, it's really nice. Uh, I would uh, recommend you to buy the PG controller with it because otherwise it's just like programming DX7, it's not a lot of fun. Uh, one of the other things I really like about the synths uh, synth and uh, Roland's or old Roland synths in general is that they have the pitch bend and the modulation in in one uh, lever, so it's perfect to play leads on there and basses with modulation and a lot of pitch uh, pitch bending stuff. That's this for this corner.